Story 61 of The Sun's Babies by Edith Howes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Where White Waves Play, Part 9, The Oyster Babies. The oyster mother was talking to her babies. You are leaving me to make your own way in the sea, she said. Keep in mind what I have so often told you, that everybody bigger than yourself is an enemy to be avoided. Here is something else to remember. When you are tired of swimming about and wish to settle down to grow your shells, choose a clean, gravelly bank or a firm rock floor. Sand or mud, if you choose those, would sift into your shells with every tide, and you would soon be choked. And when your shells are made, never forget that an oyster's chief concern in life is to know when to shut up. A moment too late in that, and life is over for you. The baby swam out of the shell. This was not their first expedition, but in former times they had stayed near their mother, ready to slip in at the first scent of danger. Now they were to take care of themselves. No babies could have looked less fitted to do it. So tiny were they that the whole three hundred of them, placed head to tail in a line, would not have measured longer than one's middle finger. Boneless, shellless, weaponless, their only safeguard was their water-like transparency. It seemed impossible that creatures so tender could live in the savage sea, where hungry monsters roamed incessantly in search of prey. Yet they were not afraid. Perhaps they were too young to think. Up they went. Near the surface of the sea they met a shoal of cousin babies. "'We are going to travel before we settle down,' said the cousins. "'Will you join our party?' "'We shall be delighted,' said the babies. The shoal set off. There were millions now, darting here and there, their tiny round bodies flashing like crystal globules through the water, their belts of swimming hairs wafting the microscopic creatures of the sea into their ever-ready mouths. For days they traveled, growing every hour a little larger, but still defenseless in the savage sea. Sometimes lurking enemies dragged off stragglers from the edges of the shoal. Sometimes a great fish drove through their millions with his mouth wide open, swallowing all that came within his path. Then the ranks closed up again, and went onward as before. But the shoal was smaller than at first, and the babies grew more watchful. At last they were tired, and a little frightened, too. "'Let us find a settling place and grow our shells,' said one. They sank to the sea floor. It was sand. That would not do. They drifted on. The sand gave place to mud. That would not do either. They drifted on again. At last a stretch of gravel, clean and firm, lay beneath them. A splendid place, said the babies, joyfully, remembering their mother's words. Down they dropped, each one settling on a stone, and there fixing himself for life. Now came the marvelous making of those strong shells which were to be their safe retreat from every enemy. Furnished by the rich seafood, a limey fluid formed in each soft baby's body to ooze through tiny pores in his outer skin, and there to harden into shell. Day by day, week by week, the beautiful growth went on, till a two-walled house was made, with lustrous pearly lining and a powerful hinge to pull the edges of the walls together. At first the shells were thin, Hungry whelks, finding them, could bore round holes in them with their sharp-pointed shells, and so reach the juicy babies. Wandering starfishes could clasp them in their long ray arms and swallow shell and baby whole. But as the months and years passed by, and the surviving babies grew to greater size, layer after layer was added to the shells, until at last, rock-hard and strong, they kept out all intruders. Now the oysters were secure. From helpless, shellless, reckless babies they had grown to cautious, well-defended dwellers in the sea, living quiet lives in peace within their firm shell walls. When no enemy was near, their shells lay open. 
Their fringed, delicate gills were hung out and waved to and fro to catch their food. But at the first alarm there was a quick withdrawing of the gills, an instantaneous closing of the shelly walls. To the enemy all was firm locked, silent, hidden. The babies had grown into full knowledge. They had learned when to shut up. End of story 61